that we're going to be speaking to, but they all fit together really, really well. And um, I have to push holistic management because it's meant so much to me. Uh, I've been a rancher uh, running the family place in South Africa for close to 27 years. I uh, moved over to Texas recently and um, enjoying it. There's a no reason we had snowmageddon. <laughs> a South African wanted to see the, the snow. <laughs> well, if I can uh, take responsibility for something that amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think the place for me to start is, you know, as um, Betsy was saying, it's all interrelated. And and then gradually go from this interrelated to the, the heart of my topic, which is linking what's happening in the soil to what's happening in the plants, to what's happening in the animals, to what's what, what we, how healthy or not healthy we are. So my little piece is the animal portion as it relates to grass and soil and as it relates to people. And um, I've got pens in my pocket. So we've got in holistic management three circles, and um, it's very tempting to draw a dollar sign in the economic section, because in terms of economics, so many of us are in the economics realm. It's money. How well did we do? It's money. How well did we do financially? How well is someone respected? it's very often related to income. And yet what's happening here compared to there is true wealth. So I want to put a big W in here and not a dollar sign because we get off track when we talk about the money side. Over here, I'm gonna put a big E for ecosystem process because it could be ecology. But if I think about holistic management, I think about water cycle, mineral cycle, solar capture and what Betsy was talking about so much is biodiversity. So within this realm, let's talk about how we are improving each of those. And down here is the people piece, the social piece. That's me, that's we, us, community, family, business. And, and linking these all is a goal. And I have to talk about the holistic goal, the four part. What are our assets? What are we managing? The value system by which we operate. Next to the value system is what do we do to be fulfilled? And the bottom part and the unique part to holistic management when we're talking goals and objectives is what is the ecosystem function we need for the grandbabies, as Betsy was saying. What does this need to be in the future? We have goals, we talked about goals. Our organizations have mission statements. We have all these things to guide our way, but very often we're forgetting about this future piece. And it's fundamental, and yet it's not part of how we make decisions. Wealth is, what is that? To some people, it's evil. <laughs> if you've got too much wealth, you're a capitalist, you've taken too much from more than you deserve. To others, it's how much money you have. But what is this? It's health, it's resource, it's so many things that are more than just a dollar sign, right? And I think in this whole that we're discussing, it's really important to, to keep our focus on all of these and then um, we've got this decision-making matrix, which is so valuable to me in the way I've used it. Layers of decisions to test our decisions to this whole. I talk about it a lot and with confidence because it fundamentally changed my family relationship. My relationship with my dad. He was the stockman. I was the ecologist. I made lots of mistakes with ecology pushing animals too hard. And that's where I'm heading because I really want to share with you some of my lessons on profitability, economics, animal performance, the money earning portion of your business, money earning 
being the fuel for the tractor of your business. So I'm talking about, we pour it in the fuel tank, that's the, the, the business's fuel tank, and we burn it. And the, if we doing it right, it will produce more grass, more product, more health in the soil. And if we burn it in the wrong way, we're going to have a declining ecosystem. But we've got to have the money component there. We can only drive this tractor, this business, as hard as the money that we're earning to improve the whole. And uh, in speaking at a lot of events like this, it's, it, it strikes me how many people are wanting to improve the ecology at the expense of the animal. To, exp to extend that thought, how many ecologists believe that you can't have an increasing economy if you're doing ecology? They're kind of mutually exclusive. You've got to have one or the other. You either degrade and make money or you fix and restore at a cost. And I think what's so beautiful about what we're all discussing is that it's beautifully interlinked. It can be done, but it's a bit like walking a tightrope with a few dimensions because we're managing risk of drought and running out of grass. We're risking or we're balancing animal performance and we're balancing ecological performance. And uh, Christine talked about monitoring. Brandon talked about monitoring. Betsy talked about monitoring. There's so much data in our lives. What's the difference between monitoring and data? And let's talk a little bit about that. Hopefully we've got enough time to do all this, but uh, there's a huge difference there. And I really want to focus on that and that we have to keep all these aspects in mind. We juggle it. It's not about success in one realm. It's holistic. So, where am I heading from here? <laughs> Cheat sheets on the ground. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. So, if we're looking at animal performance, as it relates to what Betsy was talking about, We've got forage out there, and um, depending on who you're talking to, this is good forage, good for nothing forage. <clears throat> Depends how long you leave it, it'll be worse if it's not grazed. But we've got what we've got, and we've got animals that we've got, and we need to turn what's in here into money, right? That's the fuel in the engine. How do we best do that? Put differently, what do we have to monitor to make sure that this is better next year and the animals are performing okay and we're not going to run out of grass? Because a lot of these things actually work against each other. We hear a lot about grazing in a three-leaf phase. You've got to graze it when it's really high in bricks and the sugars are high. And on the other side, we hear, well, you're not managing properly because you're going to run out of grass. You should have had more grass or you're in springtime. You've got animal, you're, you're looking at your dung and it's all squishy and stinky because the animals are grazing really, really short grass because there isn't enough food out there. They're losing weight, they're in ketosis. What should you have done six months, eight months, ten months ago in the planning? How can we simplify what we're monitoring so that we're achieving what we need to be achieving? Let's squish down the number of things that we're monitoring because it's really complex, right? I mean, who can relate? <laughs> Just for interest, who of you are managing livestock? Okay, who of you are crop and livestock? And only crops, not farming. Okay, good. Just to get an idea. <laughs> um, so going back to this discussion around, well, how do we keep animals performing? Any of you know about how grass is digested in a ruminant? So you've got a long tube. And we got horns on the one end, or ears, and uh, this will be a happy cow. And we've got a tail on the other, 
and stuff comes out of here. So if it's good quality material, it goes in, it goes through this long digestive process, it gets chewed up, ruminated back through. But if it's good quality for, um, material, it's going through here in a couple of days, right? Two days, two and a half days, depending. If it's old and stalky, it's going in, it's going through really slowly. And what's critical about understanding this is when the quality of the forage declines, the rate of passage slows down and the amount of nutrients coming out of that forage decreases. And the cow can't digest it. The cow is incapable of digesting cellulose. It's a microbial process. Just like what's wonderful in the soil, it's wonderful what's happening in here. A lot of people don't want to feed anything. It's bad. Expensive. It's. But if you've got the food, it's energy. Anyone today can match to dry grass? pretty hot right <laughs> that's all energy so how come the animal can't digest it why is it going through the rumen slowly it's the combination like in the soil it's got to be the right combination for the microbes to thrive so we actually can help that microbial process we can assist that microbial process by adding some expensive some not so expensive depends on what the production that we're needing out of that animal Particularly if your animal's not perfectly suited to its environment. If you take a deer in this environment, it's able, it's got a little mouth, it can go along and it can select high quality forage. A cow, we put it in a paddock, first day it selects all the good stuff, second day or second hour, depending, it has lower quality and lower quality. We're controlling what it's able to do. I find it fascinating in South Africa where game farming, wildlife farming has become a massive industry that the animals, the wild animals that have never had uh, domestic diseases are now suddenly de de developing tick-borne diseases that have never been heard of before. So there's something about the restriction on their ability to select. It's, I mean, we're talking the same language, right? It's just from a different perspective. So suddenly wildlife are getting diseases they've never been known to have. So there's something in the selection process and the biodiversity that we need to, to help along. But we've got to keep the tractor running, right? We've got to keep the fuel coming in to keep this business going, our business tractor. So what have we got to do if the animal performance is dropping? You all know that if the animal gets thin, it's really expensive to get that condition back, right? So it's much cheaper to keep an animal in the same condition than it is to add weight. And if we're talking monitoring, it's one thing to monitor animal condition, but what are the key points in the production cycle that we need to hit? Anyone got some feedback for me? What are the key things in a sheep, cattle, ducks, chickens? What are the key things? I don't know if chickens, so maybe we won't go to chickens, but <laughs> ruminants, what are the key things? Key points in a production cycle that we have to hit. Conception. Conception, I would say, and more critical birth. is what's her condition at birth, when she gives birth. So we talk about body condition scoring. Who's familiar? <laughs> body condition score. Okay, so one to five scale, one to ten scale, one to nine scale. There's a whole lot of different ones out there. The point being that if you want a high proportion of your animals to reconceive, they have to be in a good body condition score when they calve. Extremely, extremely critical. It's one thing to monitor animal condition, but what's your target? What's your key target date? And someone over here mentioned the other one is what's happening at mating. They don't have to be in really good condition at mating. They need to be on a rising plan of nutrition. The quality of food that they're taking in needs to be improving. So if we're talking <coughs> minimum monitoring, body condition score at carving, if you on a uh, one to nine scale at six, at carving, you will have 
over 80% of them reconceive. If they are under that weight, it falls off dramatically. And if they're too fat, they're also not going to reconceive because the fat breakdown at calving blocks the kidneys, blocks the liver, and actually prevents them from getting rid of the hormones in the system. So it's a pretty complex balance, but body condition score at calving is number one for follow-on production. It's really important. So we're going to look at a little bit at body condition score on the animals out here and, and get a feel for that. Just to give you some background, at different weights, you have different areas. Anyone want to help me here? Uh, from thin, a really thin animal, what are you looking at? It's mostly along the spine and how much flesh is on the ribeye muscle. If the spine is really, if you look across at the animals there, can you see anyone with ribs across the back? The other one that you're looking at, so the ribeye, is it concave, flat or convex? So that, that's critical in, in thinner animals. The other place to look is how much rib covering, how much of the rib is showing. So if you've got the ribs are deeply incised, that animal is really, really thin. If there's a little bit of rib, you can just make it out. She's in, or he's in all right condition. If you can't see any rib, then obviously it's in much better condition. So you're looking at an overall animal condition, but getting to know your, your body condition score relative to dung, relative to how they're behaving, is what we call stockmanship. It determines how you're moving and it determines if you should, when you should supplement. Yes? I need to ask a question. Sure. Maybe not now. Maybe but now's a great time. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the influence of age and genetics on stockage? It's big. Genetics is huge. Uh, it, and it's complex. So I see now maybe why you wanted to, to, to wait a little bit. Right. A age <laughs> and teeth are really highly cor correlated. There's nothing you can do with an old cow who's lost her teeth. Dental implants. <laughs> Economic. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, we in wet cycles with lots of grass would mouth. I know that's a lot of work. You open the animal's mouth and how many teeth she got. If she's got no teeth, out she goes. If you can't do that, older animals, if you look at depreciation and value, it's better to have a cow sold before she's lost her teeth. But sometimes that cow can produce a really good calf. So it's where's the cuddle on age. Younger animals obviously need a higher plane of nutrition. Smaller animals, relatively, need a higher plane of nutrition because the, the rumen is smaller, right? Mm -hmm. So they've got a smaller vat for biological activity to happen for that plant decay, well, decay digestion, it is decay. What's happening in there depends on the vat size. The animal's adaptability, I mean, I, um, Stefan's going to be talking a bit later and uh, Fred, who he's doing a lot of work with, opened my eyes to animal selection and genetics not necessarily being a genetic function but what that calf's mother taught it about its local environment this local adaptability local knowledge that's passed from cow to calf is so so valuable but selecting rather than chucking out everything that you own to buy better genetics those animals are adapted and what can you do to kick out the, the lower producing animals, bring in a bull or a cow that can produce the better genetics or is better adapted and gradually bring them in that way rather than just a quick throw up. So, yeah. Do you have more questions? <laughs> <laughs> genetics, it's so personal too, yeah. So, speaking of genetics, I just want to chime in. Um, I have Dexters. Um, when you run the numbers, and, and you, Wayne, you talk a lot, a lot about the numbers of the profit, 
you know, when I take these animals to the processor, it's still the same kill fee, but I get much less meat than if I had Angus or any of the other animals. But for personal reasons, cattle scared me. They were the last animal, last livestock that I brought on the ranch. I don't have a lot of experience with handling cattle. So I wanted cattle that didn't intimidate me. Um, and also their personality that they're curious. I, I was sharing with somebody, I can go out and sit in the field and they'll come and they'll start playing with my pigtail and, <laughs> and chew my boots. And, and so I am learning how to deal with the cows. If as a, as a profitable enterprise, I need to consider that these are not the optimal animal if I'm running a meat business. But for now, this is wonderful because I'm getting that experience that I was I didn't have and I'm getting comfortable, which when we talk about quality of life and you know, we all have these visions of what ranch life is gonna look like. When you're scared of the animal and you're like, oh, it, that's not, you know, that's not good. So anyway, just a side note, because I, I get a lot of questions, why Dexter's? Aside from the fact that I like red, so I like the red animals. And, and for me, the visual components of the ranch is very important to me. And that goes into the holistic goal, right? My ranch is gonna look different than everybody else's because just like I have my own unique fingerprint, your ranch is gonna be a direct reflection of who you are, what you value, what you want. Good. And as she ana analyzes the uh, cost benefits, maybe that will change, <laughs> and that's quite fine. And the other, the other point there too is that red dexters have a reputation for being relatively easy to finish on grass. Yes. So that has a an yes. impact also. But there'd be a negative side to the size and the back the and, of, and the selection yeah. that so you'd need. The cuts you can get off. Yep, absolutely. But it's all part of the big picture. Yeah. And what I can't you get want. A, yeah. I can't get a tomahawk, a tomahawk steak out of my dextrose. Right. Right. So that's that's the, a big no no. The last one I slaughtered, I got two cheap ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so why are you there? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I'm going to digress a little bit into just the importance of recognizing these um, relationships between animals and grass. So when you're talking, well, what's the value here? In, we're looking at, I, I keep going on, well, you've got to make money. Yes, you do. And then why is it so important that we have animals? And why is it so important that we bring in the density? Why is it important that we're looking at, well, how much of the forage are they utilizing and then experimenting with well what's the timeline because we've got all these three variables that are our cheap management variables that can have this huge impact if you wanted to put more of the forage that's in that selection in that camp paddock fenced off area what's the kind of animal that's going to help you improve that at a low cost to get ecosystem function higher, we need more of the plant material through the rumen at a level that can keep the animals productive. It's that trade-off, it's that constant, constant trade-off. And I have to talk about the microbial reaction of, uh, maybe you've heard the story. What happens when you get a density graze with the soil, with uh, fertilizing and what's happening under the ground. Has any, anyone know that interrelationship of high density and why it's so valuable? Okay, so I was flabbergasted at the story when I first heard it because um, student of savories believed in the magic of density because it makes sense. It's density, recovery, if you look at a migration, if you look at what's happening in the natural world, that is how this whole grass, how these black soils evolved, was big herds of animals moved along by predators. But the critical part is that they grazing grasses, which are much newer plants in the evolutionary cycle, evolved from sedges, but are critically tied, evolutionary tied to grazing. So 
we think of succession as from bare ground to forbs to grasses to trees. But if you look at it from an ev evolutionary point of view, the grasses are more recent than the trees and they were definitely evolved with animals. And the black soils on which civilization is relying is black and humus rich because of what was happening with the buffalo, wolves, what came before the buffalo, the giant horses, over millions of years. That carbon rich soil is the plant animal interaction, feeding, accelerating, storing fertility. The critical difference here is if you've got cover on your soil from knocking down or leaf accumulation, you're getting uh, fungal decay at the soil surface. Whereas if you're getting grazing, you're getting this liquid carbon pathway that's injecting um, carbon food for those microbes. And it's a very different type of carbon. It's a very different type of uh, chemical process that's happening in the ground. So the value of the animals is, is supreme. But when you get high density and half the plant or less than half the plants above ground and a little more is under, you chop off the top, the grass is rearranging its physiological status, it's senescing roots, it's pumping a huge amount of carbohydrates, food into the soil. And with that pumping, you get a flush of microbial activity. They use up that food that's now pumped in there so fast, so rapidly that the soil goes anaerobic for a while if the utilization is high enough. And obviously the more utilization, the longer, the more foods in the soil, the longer the anaerobic process. When the party's over, the food's used up, air returns, oxygen returns, and you get this growth kit with all this available nutrient from the anaerobic. So I used to wonder what's going on. I could see it, but I never understood why it was happening. But we can't go, for the animal's point of view, we can't go and do that too much because then we're growing even more forage that's going to be even more difficult for us to put through the animal economically. It's got to be a gradual process. And if anyone understands gradual, it's not me. I got back to the ranch. I had all these great ideas. I'd worked with some of Stan Parsons' clients here in the US. I'd seen 700 head of cows in a herd. It was easy. All we did was move them, you know? Get back home. Dad, you've been doing it all wrong all these years. I know what to do. Put all the animals together. Didn't have the water, didn't have the bulls, and created holy hell. And my dad was okay. He was a great guy. Uh, he. Uh, forgave me, he let me make mistakes, but it was expensive and it was a steep, steep, hard lesson to learn because it was a big, big mess. So if you hear anything today, try things, experiment, monitor, not just monitor, observe, interpret, and react. So many people, as I came into HMI, I've interviewed a lot of people who've been using holistic management, holistic management type things. Everyone agrees monitoring sucks. Monitoring sucks because it's data and not being interpreted. There is such huge value in monitoring. So the message that I want you to take away today is on animal performance. If you can target your animal performance where is it that they need to be in that good condition? Where is it that they need to have really good nutrition? And aim your day-to-day -day moves or lack thereof on those key targets. Because if you get it wrong, it's really expensive. The worst thing you can do is get a pregnant animal thin before she calves. Because that blocks up that liver and that reproductive cycle terribly, terribly bad. So if you want to give your animals a break and maybe have a holiday, prior to carving, let those animals select. Don't go and do high density at a critical point that's going to cost you a lot of money. Yes, there's issues with moving baby calves with cows. Understood. 
those are times of the year where you do not need density. It's not a density all the time at all costs game, right? Yes. So what you were alluding to holistic plan grazing? Yes, absolutely. You can't, you've got to use the planning. You have to, it's too complex otherwise. There's too much complexity in what we're talking about to do it without a plan. Because everything changes, and if you don't have a plan, you can't change it. But having a grazing plan and sticking to it in terms of when your animals move without monitoring the animal condition, ask me, it's really expensive. If you're moving faster than your grazing plan is allowed for, what does it mean? You're either overstocked or you're not supplementing the microbes like you could. And it's an either-or game, right? Well, there's another option. If your animals are losing condition and they've got carbs at foot, you can remove the carbs. But that's a cost-benefit game. So that's monitoring, knowing what your costs are. I'm, I'm trying to highlight that this is all manageable stuff. I'd love to go into the risk management side of things monitoring how much food you have, allocating it out. I don't think there's enough time today, but just changing your minds a little bit on production and the importance of production. It's wonderful to see prairie improving. It's wonderful to see soil coming to life, but a critical, a critical, critical aspect is the money and the wealth. It's an interplay.